Um, and as well as being former secretaries of states who have, of course, therefore had to drive change within the NHS um, and therefore will have a deep understanding of some of the pitfalls and the challenges, uh, as well as, of course, uh, the opportunities. And I'm sure both will have, you know, both fantastic uh, memories of things they achieved and potentially, uh, given how complex the NH NHS is, a few scars on their backs uh, from, from different changes that they uh, drove through in uh, role. Um, it is an in conversation, but we will still be opening up to questions. Um, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us and is watching uh, on our YouTube channel at the moment. Um, you can still ask questions. You just need to pop any questions you have into the chat function uh, at the bottom of the YouTube channel. Uh, or if you would prefer, you can tweet any questions uh, to uh, at Reform Think Tank. Um, so if you want to prefer to put your questions on Twitter, you can do that. Um, the brilliant Reform team will be looking at those questions and making sure that I get them so that I can put them uh, to uh, Alan and Stephen. So we have 45 minutes, um, so I, I won't spend very long kind of doing any context. You're all an expert audience anyway, so you will have read, I'm sure, um, cover to cover the white paper. I'm sure you've also read the various papers that um, have been put out around the changes to public health England. Um, so I'm not going to go through in detail any of that. Suffice to say that clearly the pandemic has um, both shown incredible strengths and value of the NHS, but also some of the challenges of having a very large, very complicated, sort of almost overly centralized, but equally incredibly fragmented uh, system to drive change, which clearly was why, or in part why the government has decided to put out a white paper, uh, looking to um, increase accountability, reduce bureaucracy, uh, and to boost collaboration and integration. So I will get to some specific questions around the white paper and, and how likely perhaps it is to succeed uh, as we see another restructuring for the NHS. But just to start off, um, I wanted to um, ask both of our former uh, Secretaries of State uh, an open question, which is, if anyone, and I spent a little bit of time as a management consultant, I know you both have uh, worked for, or indeed still work for very large consultancy. So as a management consultant, you often go in, if you want to do um, sort of change management, you have to ask, where is it we're starting from? So what, what does something look like now in order to be able to work out where you want to get to and how you're going to get to um, the vision you have for the future? So could I ask you both for your reflections on, on what state you think the service is currently in and what are the key lessons or takeaways for you um, from the pandemic and how the NHS or the health and care service more broadly um, has responded to the pandemic? Um, Alan, if I could start with you. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks for organising. Thanks, everybody, for listening and viewing. Great to see Stephen again uh, as well. Um, Great to so see I you. think we are we're at the hard point. I mean, the last year has been hugely difficult for the care system, not just the NHS, but for social care as well. Um, the NHS has really come through very well, and you can see that particularly with the vaccination program, which is a huge success story. Um, but we now move into the really difficult phase where the system is both having to deal with the after effects of COVID, i.e. the stress strain on the staff, um, COVID is an ongoing and probably enduring phenomenon that we're going to have around, despite the vaccination programme, and the backlog that has been caused as a consequence of prioritising it, with one and a half million people, for example, waiting over six months for a hospital operation. So, so this is when it gets really hard. And what COVID's all also done, I think, frankly, is expose the fragility of the care system and particularly of social care. And arguably, it has been the straw that has broken social care's back. And hopefully, we'll come onto this, will actually lead to some meaningful reform. It would be good to think that that's finally going to happen uh, after many years of, of waiting for it. Um, equally, I would say that more optimistically, you know, the fragility in the care system that COVID's exposed has also been paralleled by the exposure of the fragility in our society. Um, and it's no surprise that issues of equity have come to the fore, precisely because COVID is both pernicious and it's unfair. 
you're twice as likely to die from it if you're living in a disadvantaged area than in an advantaged one if you get it. All of those sort of figures that everyone's very familiar with. I hope what that does is pivot the care system towards three objectives, more population health management, more earlier intervention on prevention, and critically, a bigger focus on health inequalities. And the reason I think for optimism, despite all of the difficulties that the system is gonna go through, is that we're on the brink of, indeed we may be in a healthcare revolution, which is really the convergence of genomic science and data analytics, and what that could mean for the future. So the real question is, are we going to harness those opportunities in order to deal with those challenges. The white paper is probably not an answer to that. Great opening, thank you very much. Uh, and Stephen, your, your thoughts on where we are at the moment and the key lessons from the pandemic? Well, I'll try and avoid repeating what Alan just said because unsurprisingly, I think I agreed with almost every word. And perhaps I can pick up where he left off, which is uh, if, if you, uh, begin with a problem statement and then compare the white paper with the problem statement and does the white paper solve the problem. Uh, I think one thing I'd add to what Alan said around the pandemic is that I suspect we've all heard people say multiple times uh, that uh, to the extent that the system has responded and it has responded magnificently, albeit with some significant failings in particular around the interface between health and social care, to the extent that it has responded, it's responded by working around the structures that exist uh, and, and avoiding the structures that exist rather than using them. And so uh, the, you asked the, how we would sum up where we start from. I think the answer is that the system in a structural sense is confused. That's not that individuals within it are confused, they're very focused. And indeed, one of the things that's happened through the pandemic is they've become more focused on delivering outcomes for individuals rather than satisfying bureaucratic processes. Uh, but uh, the, the, uh, the system itself is confusing uh, and the, the, um, the ambition set out in the white paper is one I wholeheartedly support. I used to talk about it uh, 30 years ago, which tells you part of the problem. <laughs> the ambition uh, is to create a more joined up service where, as Alan rightly says, information flows around the system, but actually the system is able to work together to deliver early intervention, preventive activity, quick discharge for those who shouldn't be in hospital, avoiding hospital for those who never need to go there. All of those standard things uh, have been much, much talked about. Uh, the ICS was dreamt up uh, by NHS England without much help actually from the government uh, uh, as, the, the, as the means by which some of this rhetoric was going to be translated into action. Uh, the difficulty that I think we're gonna come on to discuss is uh, when you come to look into the detail, uh, how are those ICSs proposed, uh, intended to work? And to what extent, if I can put the question simply, to what extent is the, uh, are the structures that are envisaged in the white paper going to be successful at uh, securing all the advances in collaboration that have been made over the last 12 months and building on them rather than reverting to some of the institutional battles that have uh, been the history of the health service over years that uh, Alan and I have both been involved in. And um, uh, thank you. I mean, I, th I think that's incredibly helpful starting point. Um, I wonder, Alan, I mean, Stephen there made the point that um, things that he was talking about 30 years ago are things we're still talking about today. You know, I read in Ken Clark's memoirs, him saying to you that, you know, some of the speeches you gave uh, back in kind of the late 90s were things that, you know, he, he'd been talking about. How far is it possible to do transformation in such a large, vast, complicated uh, institution? Um, and I suppose in that sense, you know, whatever the white paper said about whether it's structures or kind of ambitions in, in terms of what, what the NHS might look like in the future, how far does a sector of state really have the power to drive that change? Um, well, it's obviously not easy, <laughs> is it? I feel like uh, that's an understatement. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, but of course, it's entirely possible. But you've got to get the diagnosis right and you've got to get the prescription right. 
Um, and, you know, it always takes time. It always takes longer than you think. Um, successive governments always underestimate that. They always underestimate how hard it is to change culture. It's relatively easy to reach for the sort of structural fix in the toolbox and hey we have yet another white paper focusing on organizational tinkering um and in my view it's asking the fundamentally wrong question by the way i mean the fundamental question that you should be asking today is how do we harness the great benefits that are coming down the line as i say of these advances in the science medical knowledge data analytics and therefore, what are the corresponding changes that you need to make, whether it's in the infrastructure and the state of the NHS, the incentives that operate within it, the workforce that we will need in the future, in order to harness those benefits to improve health and critically optimize um, outcomes. And that's the question that is entirely missing from the current, frankly, from the current debate, never mind the white paper. And it's bizarre. It's almost like there are parallel universes going on here, where you've got this sort of structural debate going on. And look, there are aspects of the white paper that are perfectly fine. Um, it's a perfectly good thing to declutter by getting rid of the CCGs. I mean, thank God they've been put out of their agony, because that's where they've been for the last period of time. And all of the workarounds that, frankly, Simon Stevens has introduced, whether it's STPs, ICSs, the quasi-merger of NHS England and NHS Improvement, they're sort of formalised through the white paper and the following structures that will arise through, through legislation. It's all fine. Integration is a really great idea. It's one that Stephen and I have, you know, we shared platforms for years arguing the case for. It makes a huge amount of sense, giving an ageing population and the huge challenge of comorbidity and chronic disease that we face. But let's not kid ourselves. You know, getting a bunch of organizations and individuals in a local area to sit around a table and sing Kumbaya is not going to deal with the challenges that the system faces any more than it is going to harness the opportunities that I believe are in front of it. And that's because some fundamental elements are missing from the reform agenda that the government, in my view, should be taking forward. I mean, we can come on to some of this later if you want, but is it possible to do it in answer to your question? Yes, of course it is, but you have to have clear insight, a particular style of leadership, and the ability to engage with not just the system, but with the local communities and local people who in the end are the beneficiaries or otherwise of that system. So you can do it, but the, um, I mean, the, 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 you know, this particular starting point, you know, to be frank, is not a great one. And in my view, it won't hold and will be back to something that looks more like reform in the future, near future. This white paper is really about replumbing. It's not about reforming. And um, Stephen, on that point, so one of the things that the white paper is trying to achieve is a, um, greater degree of accountability and, and by that we mean political accountability so um, one of the things that the Secretary of State has been very clear about is that uh, he felt he didn't have the 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 levers to hand or at least uh, even if he'd had the levers the the kind of action that comes from pulling a lever was not as timely or as prompt or, or quite in the shape or form that he wanted during the pandemic so one of the things that that he feels he has learned is that you know he as Secretary of State couldn't get the things done that he wanted to get done um, in the current structure. How far do you think the white paper is A, going to solve that challenge and B, is it the right challenge to solve or is actually the kind of centralization um, and the kind of heavy handedness almost of, of the center one of the problems given your observation of the you know the kind of workarounds we saw during the pandemic were often at a local level rather than at the center? Well, I have a very strong view that the uh, the instinct that is still prevalent in parts of Whitehall, only parts actually, uh, that uh, what we need is the power for ministers to intervene and tell people what to do, is a very good illustration of the old law that to every complex problem there's a solution that is simple, obvious and wrong. 
Uh, and so I, I start the proposition, that's not the answer. And it's actually worth just, uh, this sounds anecdotal, but I think it's actually it goes to the very heart of the matter. When the white paper was published, if you remember, or around the publication of the white paper, it was briefing came out of Downing Street over the weekend uh, that said uh, that this was going to be strengthening ministerial accountability, allowing political accountability for the health service, giving ministers power to direct and so forth. That was the weekend briefing. By Thursday, the briefing was that this was going to empower local communities to take control of their public services that serve them and engage local people in local decision making. Well, it seems to me unlikely that both of those propositions are true in the same white paper. And uh, of course, the truth, uh, I mean, but it, what it demonstrates is a degree of confused thinking. So go back to your question, is it possible uh, to improve the performance of the health and care system. Uh, of course, it's possible to do it. It's a human made organization. And if you think it through, it's possible uh, to significantly, in my view, improve the way it works. Uh, but you do have to have, you, you have to begin by asking yourself the question, are you going to do that more effectively by strengthening local, uh, national power of intervention? Or are you going to do it more effectively uh, by building local communities that think across silos and own the solutions. Mm. I'm a very strong advocate of the second approach over the first. The problem with this white paper, as that anecdote around its publication illustrates, is that it tries to ride both of those horses at once and they are fundamentally incompatible. Maybe just to add to that, Stephen, just, just before we come back, yeah. Charlotte. I mean, you could argue, I think, even more than that, that arguably this is the first statement of public policy around the future of healthcare in 40 years, that rather than continuing the journey towards more devolution, actually reverses it. Because really from Ken Clark's pioneering reforms onwards, the journey has been about how do we, if you like, denationalize this enormous, vast organization now employing close to one and a half million people, get power and responsibility, financial control and clinical decision making better aligned where the rubber really hits the road, which is in the interface between local services and local people. And that's why Foundation Trust, for example, in a sense, were the sort of peak moment of that, which is why they, they, they were created. But what you've now got is an answer which seems to say the answer really lies in an office in Whitehall. Now, my experience and Stephen's too is that, look, you might be the best health secretary that the world has ever seen, okay? And few people, I think, are arguing that that might be the case right now. But even if you were such a person, organizationally, it's impossible to run the system from that office because your locus of control is so low. The interface happens locally, not nationally, and nor will it work politically because, you know, when Matt decides, I think born out of frustration, partially maybe with NHS England, and partially because he's the guy in the front line and he's got to be in the TV studios and at the dispatch box. But when you start nationalizing responsibility for NHS Foundation Trust resources, the shape of local services, even the appointments to key positions within the NHS, you know, to use that famous Nye Bevan phrase, bedpans that are reverberating in Tradiga, well, that's the Welsh government's responsibility, in Tranmere or in Trafford nowadays, when they start reverberating in Matt Hancock's office in Whitehall, my sense is he isn't going to particularly like the noise. Uh, and so politically it doesn't work, organisationally it doesn't work. What you've got to get is the right balance between national standards, national frameworks, sure national systems of inspection, all of that sort of stuff, and local autonomy. And unfortunately, this swings the pendulum away from that. And that's one of the reasons that it won't work. And if I can and ask... Can I just... Yeah, go, yeah. Sorry, go, go do you mind if I just build on that? Because I, I just want to pick up, I, I agree with absolutely everything Alan said, but I just pick up one statistic you used, Alan, which I, I, you know, we've all done it. It's the one and a half million people working in the health service. If what we're building 
is a health and care system. Of course. It's actually the three million people exactly. who work across both the health and care system, everyone from the, uh, the home care assistant uh, through to the consultant surgeon. Uh, and the, the, it's just, I mean, just pause and reflect. We're talking here about 10% of all activity, social, act economic activity in the UK economy. The idea that the whole of the, that 10% of the economy be, can be run by a single person sat in Whitehall is simply bizarre. It's fanciful, isn't it? And you're quite right. I mean, I mean, the, the other big missing element from this, and it's very, it's highly ironic, given the focus is really on structural integration. And there's, as I say, a very compelling case for that alongside other levers. It's deeply ironic that the most key missing element of that is reform of social care, where we know that without fundamental reform, both of its funding and its organizational structure, it's a broken model. It's been broken for many years, the tragedy is that it took COVID to really expose that fact with huge human suffering as a consequence. And I, I do want to, I want to come back to the social care question, but just on the, on the point of how do you drive the sort of change, which is place-based, and that is a phrase that the white paper uses. And in fact, um, you know, I think we could call for much more place-based uh, delivery of public services across the board uh, of which NHS um, and care is one but is the answer much more devolution you know should the Secretary of State be someone as as Alan I think you're you're implying that sets the service standard uh, and probably does some stuff at the very expensive kind of rare end of medicines and diseases and you know pandemic preparation stuff but actually, should we be going you know, further even than the kind of Manchester model and saying, actually, rather than it being health, I mean, the white paper talks about a duty to collaborate with local authorities. I mean, you know, look, there's been a duty to collaborate on all sorts of things from safeguarding to, you know, multiple other areas that never really translates into something. Actually, should the NHS be run by local government? Well, I mean... It I just <laughs> I wanted to pick uh, I think should it be run by local government I think that's a huge leap uh, and I'm not I, I, I'm not in favor of simply sort of picking it a lift and shift to local government I don't think that's the answer I think that's a sort of institutional guess if I can put it that way um, but the what I I absolutely am in favor is continuing, as Alan said, the journey that we've been on since 1990 of, uh, of localizing management. And in, importantly, not just localizing management within the health service, uh, but broadening the range of issues that, local, that, that are brought to bear to, to, on health question. And that I, I want to pick up the point you were making, Charlotte, that this isn't just about the health service. It isn't even just about the health and care system. Uh, there's a person, a, a public sector health manager from America that I'm very fond of quoting when asked what was the most effective health intervention he was responsible for, it was putting air conditioning units into low income housing in Brooklyn so that people could breathe in a hot New York summer and didn't appear in the, what we would call an A&E department as a consequence. So it's joined up local public services that's not to move away from national accountability for standards of healthcare delivery. I'm strongly in favour of that. But what I'm not in favour of is funding the health service and defunding other local public services that actually have a more effective, a, a, a greater impact on health outcomes than some of the pounds spent uh, within the NHS. If, if what you do is, and, and this is what we've done, institutionally over a long period is protect and safeguard and trumpet NHS expenditure and, and defund, frankly, uh, not simply social care and social housing and other bits of social infrastructure, but also, of course, community services within the health service in order to protect NHS, the, uh, the, the, the hospital service, frankly, uh, then you shouldn't be surprised if that's the best funded, relatively speaking, the best funded bit of public service, if that's where the demand shows up. Uh, what we're doing is using the rhetoric of prevention and early intervention 
at the same time as designing a system where all the incentives go in precisely the opposite direction. And, and that's where um, I, I wanted, Alan, if I can ask you sort of the same question, but I guess with a, 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 an additional question on it. Um, there is a, I'm being I suppose, slightly kind of provocative in saying, should we just give the whole thing to, to local government? But nonetheless, there is, a, I think, a serious question as to where does the responsibility or the accountability sit then? Because, you know, if you're not going to devolve uh, the healthcare budget, the NHS budget, then you're still going to have a mismatch of incentives, of priorities, of budgets. You know, it's, it's one thing saying we're going to have these great integrated care systems. But if you pay for acute care in one way and incentivize it one way and you pay for primary care in a different way and incentivize it and then you pay for social care in an entirely different way. You know, this is the story of public services that you you can't get everyone pushing in the right direction. So there has to be some form of structural answer, even if that's woefully insufficient to drive the change on its own. I agree with that. I think that's absolutely right. And I, I, I think you're right to highlight the role of how money flows around systems and the role of incentives. And certainly my learning as Secretary of State responsible for injecting large amounts of additional investment into the NHS is that only really began to stick and pay, pay back when we got the incentive structure more aligned with the objectives. So when we introduced patient choice, when the choices that patients made were followed by how money flowed away from some organizations and towards others, that's really when you began to get traction within the system. So aligning incentives is really critical. And look, in today's world, where should the focus be? The focus should be aligning incentives around improved health outcomes, including, I would argue, reduced health inequalities. But that's nowhere on the agenda right now. We need to think about it. Just one health warning, though, because this conversation inevitably is about the benefits of devolution and integration, because that's really around, it's the focus of, of the, the thrust of the, of the white paper, if there is a thrust to it. And those are important levers. But here's the risk. I think the risk is that as we create these ICSs, and particularly as the acute sector, as it should, plays a leading role within them, we are at risk of creating what I'd call, if not local monopolies, at least local monopsonies. And you asked earlier about how do you do transformation? You don't do it with one lever. You do it with a multiplicity of levers. And if you've got this sort of aggregation of scale organizations at a local level controlling where services are gonna be provided and how they're being provided, you do need some compensatory levers. And those levers would really be about the role of choice and competition. Mm -hmm. um, they're afterthoughts in the white paper, actually graphically afterthoughts because somebody see clearly at the last moment decided that it was a really good idea to write a paragraph about the role of choice or about the role of competition. And that is madness. Now, people will say, well, these are competing things. You can't have collaboration and competition. Well, of course you have that. You have that in every large institution and every large organization that exists anywhere, certainly within the private sector, and it should exist within the public sector. So I think this, unfortunately, is the product of political timidity on the part of the current government because it is it's deeply concerned that if it looks as though it's too in favor of market-based mechanisms it will fall into that horrendous political bermuda triangle with three words at the tip of each point tory health privatization and the consequence will be felt in the ballot box i'm afraid this is where political leadership really comes into play the truth is we need a combination of levers, including the role of choice and competition, alongside devolution and integration, standard setting national frameworks. Guess what? That's a pretty complex sentence. Yes, it is, because we've got a com pretty complex care system. And the idea that you can solve the problems within it in one fell swoop with the use of one single lever, I'm afraid that is really for the birds. And Stephen, just picking up on that point, this is brilliant because you're, you're, you're both just taking me through all of the points that I, I wanted to hit anyway. So uh, uh, it's fanta fantastic, fluid conversation. Um, on that point around, because Alan's right, you know, there is lots of 
kind of vague references to choice and value for money for taxpayers, uh, whilst also at the same time saying we're just going to leave it to the NHS if they want to procure something and we all and we're going to remove the competitions and markets authority. Maybe that was the wrong entity to have involved in the first place anyway, but there does seem to be a bit of a tension at the heart of kind of what we want to achieve, but what we want to remove. And so I guess, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And is there another way of driving choice? Or is are we just saying here that we're really, we're just using the word choice as a kind of nice word, but we don't really mean it. But also, are we ignoring the fact that it's not just private sector organisations who play a very valuable role in, 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 NHS delivery, but also an awful lot of third sector organisations and third sector organisations, social enterprises that often are the ones reaching out to the hardest to help, you know, working with some of those that are perhaps, um, you know, in that point that Alan, you were raising around health inequalities. And so is that a risk of the move that the government's making? Well, I think it's a huge risk is the short answer. Uh, I uh, uh, agreed completely with what Alan said, and as he referred earlier, that we do we've done this over quite a long period, and sometimes he uses the line, and sometimes I use it, and it's a bit interchangeable. Uh, but the 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 the, the between uh, collaboration and competition, the idea these things can't coexist in the same space is just plain wrong, uh, and the, the the policy framework needs to be designed to allow natural competition. I mean, <laughs> the idea that you sort of ban competition from the medical profession, I've never met a more competitive group of people than senior doctors. They're, they're, that's, how, that's how progress is made. And uh, not just in medicine, but in life, people think of better solutions than the guy alongside them. Uh, and so the, the, the worst solution is one that sort of uh, where NHS institutions are allowed to ring the wagons and to say, uh, and uh, I'm, look, I'm a huge, a, a passionate advocate of the principles on which the NHS is built. But sometimes the NHS isn't as good at doing those principles as it is as talking about them. And sometimes it's easy to fall into the trap, and it is a trap, of believing that because the NHS is a public service of which we're all proud, what it does constitutes good public service because it's done by the NHS. That's, that, that's the kind of the, the uh, Bermuda Triangle in a slightly different uh, sense of the phrase, uh, that it's good because the NHS does it. No, that isn't right. Uh, we should always be challenging ourselves to think of better ways of, de of delivering change because uh, the, the, uh, another point that we need to uh, be clear about is that for the reasons Alan was quoting earlier on, the chain uh, advances in genomics, advances in digital science, the drivers of change, this should be a fast changing environment. And so one of the questions we should be posing for ourselves is how do you create around the whole public service arena to take the, go back to that point. How do you create uh, a policy framework which encourages a pace of change that's necessary if we're going to take advantage of the opportunities that uh, those technical advances open up for us? Um, you, don't you don't maximize the opportunity for well-judged, well-thought-through change by removing the competitive impetus. Uh, you need to institutionalize that competitive impetus in order to drive a pace of change. Change needs to be not an event, but a way of life in order to deliver benefits to citizens to avoid that. One of the things I quite often say is that Every NHS discussion says we should be patient-centric. Yes, up to a point, uh, Lord Copper. What we really should be is citizen-centric because one thing all of us share as citizens is an ambition to avoid unnecessarily being a patient. Yeah. 
Okay. And can I, Alan, just on the on the point about because we've had a couple of questions in from um, the audience about adoption of technology, you know, kind of how do we create a sort of an innovation culture within the NHS? And actually, you know, if we think back to the life sciences strategy, although whether we're continuing with that now, there's no industrial strategy, I don't know. But, you know, the life sciences strategy and then the update, uh, I think it was last year. One of the reflections in that was that um, part of the challenge for the life sciences sector and, you know, thank goodness we've got such a vibrant life life sciences sector here, and hence the vaccines, one of the challenges is just how difficult it is to get innovation into the NHS and that the NHS is not uh, always brilliantly responsive to adopting new technologies, new medicines, you know, new ways of working. And you've talked about how important that's going to be going forward. Um, and, and, you know, using the data that's available, we can we could make a big impact on population health prevention, all the stuff we've been talking about. How do you create more of an innovation culture within the NHS? Well, you've got to seize the moment because if there has ever been a period where innovation has been more visible, um, I don't know what it is than the last 12 months. So if you think about, you know, for all of the problems that there have been, the speed and agility with which the NHS responded to the pandemic the way it reorganized its estate, reorganized its workforce, all the demarcations between staff, which have existed for so long, suddenly disappeared. Outpatients disappeared as a phenomenon. 50% of consultations within a few weeks of the pandemic beginning in this country for a GP appointment went online. 70% of people today say that they want to continue with the ability to choose an online GP consultation. So we're at a moment in time, and of course you've had the huge contribution of the life sciences industry, if ever there's been a reminder about how important it is, not just to today, but to the future of our economy going forward, it's what has happened with the vaccine development. It's quite unparalleled. It's an amazing, remarkable achievement, and we should never stop saying that. And you've had this incredible informal co collaboration between the industry, within the industry, and between industry and public policy. So there's a moment where we've got to seize it and drive these changes forward and really embed them. They're, these are changes that have been made on the hoof in, in a crisis. What you should really be doing is now stepping back and analysing, so, OK, how do we make those features permanent? Um, and, you know, there are some simple things that I think we should think about. For example, there needs to be a concordat between the pharma life sciences industry and public policy about how they're going to get engaged together going forward. So the life sciences industry will always say we don't know what's on the minds of decision makers and therefore we press our head with our own R&D programs. What happened with COVID is that public policy said the priority is guess what a vaccine and the industry responded. And we should be saying the same for the great chronic diseases that are afflicting the world today moving forth. These should be the priorities. We should think about funding models that allow the pharma and life sciences industry to invest ahead of the curve to minimize risk. Equally, the pharma and life sciences industry needs to be thinking about how it can move into risk share models so that the NHS isn't always having to absorb the cost of new treatments as they come, come to market. So, look, there's a lot of innovation that has been taking place. And my fear, to be honest, is that there'll always be a natural tendency in any large institution, organisation or ecosystem that once a crisis has passed, everybody goes like that. And then we sort of go back to the old normal. There's not a single organisation I work with anywhere, whether it's you know, the university where I'm chancellor, the charities I chair, the boards that I chair, the boards that I sit on, where the conversation is about how do we go back? It's all about how do we move forward? How do we change? And that's what we've got to be capturing, that moment in time. And, uh, and I think if we do that, we can look forward with optimism to what the future of our health and care system can really look like. I'm conscious we've got about five minutes left and we haven't we haven't yet got onto social care. <laughs> so I, I'm going to I'm going to ask a, a question to each of you about social care. And then we, we do have another question that's come through about your personal experience of driving change in the NHS, which I, I think will 
we'll end on. So on the social care question, um, what is your view about, you know, is this really, and we're obviously hopefully going to get a green or white paper uh, very soon based on um, the Prime Minister's well, question. it's going to be green, isn't it? We know green, it's going to be green. green. No, that's, I think that's I'm being optimistic, green, but yes. And it's always white when it comes to NHS care to make yep. Stephen's point for him. Anyway. It is true, it's true. Okay, green paper. Um, what is the thing that you think is the most important aspect that the green paper needs to to include you know is it how you deliver it or is it about the funding is it fundamentally this is a question about funding um and so what would you each want to see in that you've you've got to do both because if you look at the history of the debate around the future of social care there have been two vertical streams of activity there's been a funding debate dylan at at all and then there's been a structural debate should we be integrating and the truth is, if you're really going to fix it, you've got to be able to do both. And funding, of course, is absolutely critical to it because we can't go on as we are under funding, cutting um, social um, care services and not providing for the challenges that we face, particularly of an aging population. And I'm afraid we're going to have to delve into some controversial and difficult areas like how we encourage, incentivize, and maybe even compel people to save for old age how we get equity release mechanisms to actually work in a market friendly way because they don't right now. So the answer isn't simply in my view at least to increase the size of the public purse as contribution to social care. We will have to do that alongside these other private sector, private generated sources of funding. And then that has got to sit alongside the structural changes that you know the white paper is is uh, you know is in, is in the territory of at least so unless you do the two together it simply isn't going to work and it's just a crying shame in my view that it is going to be green paper territory rather than white paper territory there's a big thing in politics Charlotte. there's a moment in time thing in politics where you get the permission to yeah. drive fundamental change the permission exists the question is is the government going to take it perfect and Stephen I'm not going to repeat any, I, I absolutely agree that there's no solution without money, that the money will go to the wrong place if you don't, do, if you don't reform the, the, the way it's managed. Uh, and the, the, what's fundamental to the delivery of a successful health and care system within a broader range of public services, one of the themes of this discussion, uh, is that yes, you have to fund it properly, but you have to have a set of structures that's able to channel the public resource uh, into the area where it delivers the policy purpose. And it's really quite, it's very noticeable, isn't it? Uh, that uh, ministers are regularly and rightly talking about social determinants, about the, the, all the issues Michael Marmot talks about, about health inequalities. Uh, but then when we come to the discussion about social care, uh, the, and the, the requirement to join up the different elements of the health and social care system. I mean, one of the things I, if we were getting in, if we'd got into any of the detail of the ICS structure, how can you have a, 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 an ICS structure, the purpose of which is to deliver a, an integration of health and social care? And what do we end up with? We end up with an ICH, ICS NHS body precisely in order to protect uh, the discrete nature of NHS funding in the context of the NHS of the ICS it's a complete nonsense yeah I think that could also be leveled at the uh, office for health promotion which is sitting exclusively in DHS but it's okay because it'll be a cross-government ministerial board for prevention whereas as you've just pointed out I think you know the lesson from Michael Marmot's reports is that there's not a lot to do with healthcare uh, when it comes to prevention and people's health outcomes. Um, a very final, we are at time, but very, if I can ask a very brief answer, very final question, uh, drawing on one that we've had in, but also sort of slightly building on, I hope a slightly more positive note. So the question is kind of what, what was your experience of the biggest barrier to driving change? Uh, so what was the one thing that when you were each Secretary of State for Health that you found the most difficult, uh, uh, the thing that got in the way of driving change? And I suppose my add on to that would be, and therefore what is the one piece of advice that you would be giving Matt Hancock uh, right now in time, terms of doing transformation? Perhaps even I can come to you and then Alan come to you. 
uh, there's an institutional belief in the Department of Health, or certainly was, and I can't believe it's changed, that the professions are opposed to change. And it's, it's a good illustration, I think, of the old principle that if you assume the worst of people, they seldom disappoint. Uh, any change process uh, needs to take people with it. Uh, and that's true in, in health and care services. That's even more true than usual. It's a people activity. Uh, and so what uh, the, the, if you assume people are against you, uh, then, the, as I say, they seldom disappoint. Uh, what we need to do is to demonstrate how a better managed, better focused, better prioritized and so forth, a, a better structured health and care service would be a better place to work so that the professions become the champions of change, uh, not as they sometimes have been, uh, people who are suspicious of the process. And Alan? I think, I mean, this has been a very strategic conversation and strategy is a hard thing to get it right. But what is harder is execution. You know, strategy is relatively easy, actually. You know, we could sit around, all the people on this call, and we can sort of work out a perfectly decent strategy for the future of the care system. What every care system in the world is struggling with is not strategic intent, it's execution capability. Um, certainly that will be my learning from it all. You can come up with the best ideas and the best policies and so on, but executing it is really hard. And therefore what you really need is you need a cadre of ambassadors, leaders, people who get it, and they don't sit in Whitehall. You know, they sit down in the system and they've got to feel ownership and responsibility and accountability, and they've got to feel that they're a big part of it both in the making of it and in the executing of it. So, so that's the most important thing, I think, to understand in, in these discussions. And the piece of advice for, I advise for, for Matt is the one thing that he will regret more than anything else, I predict, is that he didn't go further and faster than he eventually went, because that is the experience of anyone who sat in that, in that chair. It's always hard but in the end, you get progress through speed, determination, and courage. Be bold, because that's what the system requires. Well, and as you both highlighted, if there's ever a time where there's also as much permission to be bold as you're going to get, then that is also now. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much uh, for your time. We have, unfortunately, we've just run over, but unfortunately run out of time. Um, it's been an absolutely brilliant discussion. I mean, probably shouldn't say this, but probably one of my favorites. So so thank you so much for, for giving us your time today. I'm sure it will, we're getting great comments in um, from the audience. And I'm, I'm sure everybody will have found this incredibly valuable. Um, thank you all as well for tuning in and, and listening. You know, if you have any feedback for us, please let us know, or you've got any comments or, you know, ideas about how we can um, do better at health and uh, care integration and delivery, then, then also let us know. And as a very final comment, I feel I should give a plug to a reform um, paper that we wrote in 2017, which is laying out exactly the plan that Alan, you gave on funding social care. So if anyone would like to go and see uh, how you might be a bit bold uh, in funding social care in that mixture of general taxation plus uh, individuals taking responsibility for funding later and doing equity release, then I highly recommend recommend the reform report uh, from 2017. Otherwise, thank you so much, everyone. I will call it a day uh, and have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.